So you'll see their CIS um, content, DISA content, HIPAA content, PCI content, SOX content. That all comes out of the box. It's just a matter of me running that against some target servers. Um, the one that we were looking at for um, Poodle is this one that I've opened up. And what you can see quickly are a couple of things. So here under general, I'm just showing the ability to do a discovery, and I have some compliance. And you'll notice here as well, if I wanted to, I have this idea of automatic remediation. So what that allows me to do, and there are places for that, and then there are places where you do not want to do that. But essentially what that would do is if it saw a noncompliance, it would immediately send down the remediation package. Now what would be a better best practice is that when you see a noncompliance, you may want to do some type of alert, maybe create a ticket for that so that we have a history of any of the changes and who performed that change on this server. So again, that auto remediation has a play, maybe not for this particular thing, but the good thing to note is in Blade Logic, if you opt to do your remediations like that, you do have that capability. Okay, so here general, I hit this parts because you're able to see quickly that we're looking for that specific registry value. And then what I'm going to do is jump over to this compliance and you're able to see the remediation package that we're disabling it. So from that sense, it's very quick. It's a quick check. It's a quick fix. But as you know, when that Poodle um, vulnerability came out, a lot of people were taken aback and had to scramble and get those fixed. Okay, so here I'm going to go back to the Blade Logic portal. Again, it's the web interface, so you'll have a web interface into the portal. You'll also have that fat client. Uh, the fat client is where you would need to import um, any of those zip kits. And here we'll switch. So if we look at this heart bleed, again, just a quick looking at the uh, checks in my environment, I'm able to see really quickly. Um, I have 100% compliance on this. So when they come to the IT department and say, how do we look with respect to the heart bleed, I can present this report and say, we have 100% compliance. We don't have any vulnerabilities there. And again, just like we saw before with the Poodle, it's an import of a zip kit, and then I'm running that against my, my machines. Okay, heading back to the home, and we'll look at one more of the, the zip kits, so that content that I had to import into my console. Uh, we'll take a look at this shell shock, and what I'll do is just go right into the results for this one. Um, and here, this is coming up. So I have rules, so I basically 83% um, compliant. I have one rule that's not fixed in my environment. Again, I could fix that very easily. I can hit this target results and I can see the machine. When I click over here on the left and I'm seeing the vulnerability, so that change log is what's out of compliance with respect to um, that heart bleed. I'm sorry, with the shell shock. Okay, so here we'll go back to the home screen. Now, in addition to doing um, those breaches, kind of zero day breaches, I can look at any of the content that's staged inside of Blade Logic. So one of those that we staged up was the PCI compliance. So here at the bottom I have a Red Hat that I've done some compliance on and then a Windows PCI. And again, a lot of times people will utilize those templates, add some additional rules, and then check my servers against that. So let's go ahead and take a look at this PCI compliance. And here at the bottom, um, you'll notice the numbers are a lot larger. So uh, those, um, the poodle and the heart bleed and the shell shock, I was really just looking for a few items there. With respect to this PCI compliance, you can see here I've got a 47% compliance. I have um, 205 rules that are compliant, but I've got 233 that are not compliant. And there again, the thing I like with Blade Logic is, um, I don't have to try to guess what those non-compliances are. It's telling me, and then I can opt to build a remediation package to fix one of those non-compliant rules or all of the non-compliant rules. And so what we'll do is take a look. Um, I'm just going to head back to this home screen again for that PCI compliance. When I land on the results, you'll see for each one of these, uh, we'll let this load up on the left, 
um, we're looking at the rules. So I think it said like 233 or 219 here um, that are non-compliant. But what I'm able to see here under my account policies, what are they? I'm going to hit this next page, and you'll notice this will move from account policies to looking at a different policy, still in play for CIS compliance, but a different um, section, if you will, in that rule. So here is my security auditing. And when I click on the one on the left, then it's showing me the two servers that um, are minus that particular setting. So why is this important? Well, when I don't have these settings set, again, the Center for Internet Security says these should all be compliant, then I have vulnerabilities in my server. So what we're doing is enabling you a quick way to check to see if I have any holes and then providing you the way to fix those holes. Um, every now and again, you may decide, well, this one, although they state that's a good idea, we're going to allow an exception. So basically, I can set that as an, as an exception. It will then pass with, okay, we're going to allow that one through, and then go on to the next vulnerability or the next uh, rule that's not compliant. All right, so here we'll just head back. I'm trying to cherry pick a few of these from the regulatory and the security so we can see the differences. Um, those were on my PCI compliance. Again, I'm going to have similar settings or a similar set of rules for my Red Hat machines. If we take a quick look at those. So this is coming up. I can see quickly 37% compliant, 62% non-compliant. So someone would probably look at that and say, wow, your servers need a lot of work. And with respect to these compliance templates, they would be correct. But again, I may think they're fine, but when we start running them against those standard rules, I can see that they're grossly off. Okay? So here, again, we'll just head back to that main screen. So in addition to doing the compliance security regulatory, we also said patching was important. And so what we'll see here, um, we've run an analysis on some of those Windows servers so I can see really quickly how many are missing. So if we kind of scroll this to the bottom, I can see that I have um, three of my machines and then I got 22 missing patches. So then the next question obviously is, well, what are those 22 patches? Well, so when we go back in and look at the results, that's where we'll be able to see what exactly is missing from those boxes. And here again, when we did the patch analysis, I only looked for those that were um, the critical. You can kind of see that here on the left, but you can back that up and look at the recommended, um, the ones that are uh, low, non-security, et cetera. But here again for the demonstration, I'm just looking at critical patches. Okay, so when we start to build this up, so this MS-13, I can see all servers are missing that one. If I want to look at it more from a server perspective, I can hit 219 and see quickly. I'm just going to expand these that there are about um, seven patches missing on that one. When we look at the next one, when this total is going to come to 22, then I can go ahead and start deploying them again so we maintain some of our compliance. Okay. One more aspect to look at. So um, in addition to looking at the compliance, so we've looked at the Poodle, the Heartbleed, the Shell Shock, we've looked at some of the PCI, CIS, um, compliance, we can also from this view look at a particular server and do some actions from that perspective. So here I'm going to switch to this inventory tab, and we'll just pull up one of the servers, do a quick search. And here at the top I'm going to hit details. And so here we'll notice some of the basic information, but when I do the, the pull down, if I wanted to be specific and maybe cherry pick a server and do the Windows patch analysis or do a compliance check maybe for one of those uh, Heartbleed, Poodles, or even the CIS, I can do that on a one-off for the server. I also have this ability to do a live browse, and so what this is doing is connecting to that server and then showing me all the aspects. So kind of think of this as looking at some of those operational aspects of the server that I may want to um, set some compliance around. Okay. 
So here, I'm just going to take this back to the to the top screen. I'm going to go back into the um, the presentation. And so, Dick, if we have any questions that are coming through, if you want to pose those, we can accept those at this point. Yeah. And thank you very much, Stacey. Great job. And of course, now would be a good time if you have other questions to go ahead and, and submit them. Uh, one thing that I, I wanted to uh, ask about, I know you talked a little bit about patching, and I understand you went through the, the heart bleed, you went through shell shock, you went through Poodle, and these are all uh, server uh, issues, right, that are, that are out there that, uh, you know, maybe your servers are infected with. Once you find that you have this in infection, how do you remedi remediate? Is that when, when you were talking about doing the patching? Is that is that when is there a patch available? And, and once that patch is applied, is it automatically fixed? Is is that yes? Yeah, so is that each of the yeah each of the so here I had to deploy the poodle fix. So each of those poodle shell shock heart bleed, there is a remediation package that's available as a result of pulling down that zip kit. So here is how I made that one machine that didn't have the poodle. I applied that poodle remediation, so then I went from a zero compliance up to a 20%. So yeah, those are separate from the actual Windows patching or the Linux patching, because that's just patching the operating system versus patching any of these holes that may be, or vulnerabilities that may have um, come out that's spread all over the internet. How often are these patches? Go, go ahead. Go I'm ahead, sorry. Mike. It's just important to note that, that these zip kits are also cross-platform as well. So uh, okay. these are not just for a single operating system, but it would ultimately be the same policy that you can run against all your servers, whether they're Windows, Linux, Solaris, et cetera. And, and how often are these updates available? So the patch updates are made available as patches are released. When it comes to these vulnerabilities, uh, for each of these major vulnerabilities, we've been getting them out, um, you know, in some cases within a few hours of a vulnerability's detection uh, and, and being published, and in a couple of cases, a couple of days. Okay. So if something comes out, the chances are that you're not going to be without a patch for very long, man, sounds like. Correct. Okay. Good. All right. Uh, Mike, do you see some other? So I, I know you have access to the questions, so maybe you can run through some of the questions that that, that you've seen come in. Yeah, yeah. So, so we had some great questions come in over the Q and A, and I'm just going to answer a couple of them verbally now. Uh, so, one of the questions was that some of the issues were caused by end users not doing their job and really didn't have anything to do with a, an actual attack. So, we we definitely understand that there are cases where it's it's really an end user. If we we look at a few of them where. They got stolen credentials, as an example, uh, from a vendor potentially that allowed access to the network. At the end of the day, that wasn't really where the data loss occurred. The data loss occurred on some device where uh, potentially a binary was put in place, a worm that was gathering data. That's where we really see our play in finding those. So by utilizing what we call change tracking or file integrity management as a portion of our functionality, we can detect those changes on servers or server-like platforms, including things all the way down to the cache register, to ensure that if changes are happening to DLLs or binaries that put them in the path of the data stream, uh, specifically from that credit card reader back up to the processing server, uh, but any part of that operating system will detect it, allow you to remediate it, and maybe it would have, at the very least, chopped down the number of things accessed uh, inappropriately by a massive amount, uh, whether it would have stopped it completely because of those stolen credentials or whatever it may have been, uh, that's going to be up in the air, but at the very least making it shorter, faster to fix it, and less people affected. Um, one of the other good questions was about scalability. So from a scalability perspective, there are customers with over 150,000 servers under management. It's important to note that we have designed this, again, really to allow that level of scale while ensuring that you're not losing granularity in where you detect either a variation or a compliance issue and allowing you to repair it. Um, so uh, again, ensuring that scalability is important to our largest customers. However, all the functionality we've built is just as applicable to people with significantly less servers. So we've made it easy to use at 150,000 and even easier to use in a smaller environment. So uh, again, no matter what your size, the solution does scale to meet that requirement. 